Let me start that one again. We're back with Howard Gutman from warmer uh, winter climates today. And um, Howard, you have a background of accomplishments that really are all around human capital, meaning people, um, from inside corporate HR, um, organizational development, um, from the outside, you've, you've consulting a lot of major businesses on leadership and teams, as you said, and even winning, and um, and authoring some top business books. And um, you know, one thing I one thing I've always found is it seems like the executives that um, that don't need the coaching more want it than the ones who do. And uh, I'd like to get a sense from you as share with us how you've evolved in your career, starting with, you know, what did you want to be when you grew up and, and are you there now? Uh, I think when I became conscious of a career, <clears throat> I think uh, something in the guise of psychology is what really excited me. Um, the field of organization development that I'm in right now was not something I was even conscious of when I was in college. Mm -hmm. In fact, the firm, uh, not the firm, I'm saying the career itself, uh, really started to grow exponentially in the late 70s. So psychology. So I suppose if you look at it where my background was in social sciences, the fact that I morphed into someone dealing with organization behavior or organization development is pretty congruent. The only distinction being that I work with macro organization systems rather than just focusing on individuals from a practice standpoint. So I'd say, yeah, it's uh, there's been a somewhat like a rhythm from when I started to now. Well, it's interesting. I didn't grow up wanting to be a headhunter either. Right. <laughs> and, and, I, and I generally joke around about once a quarter, I tell myself I should have been a veterinarian when I get tired of talking to people. And then I come back after about a day and get, and get back, back with it. Um, well, you know, with respect to talent, you know, as an executive search firm, we focus, um, the two words we say the most are right fit. And when we start searches or get introduced to companies, we really try to find out from all the management people, you know, what is their why and, and, and how are they consistent, you know, with their why or their vision. Um, we also talk about talent acquisition, talent development, and talent retention, where, um, your, I would think your key contribution there is clearly in the talent development, which impacts the acquisition and retention, at least in our opinion. Tell us about your experiences, how how people truly still are the number one asset, if you will, of a company, and what leaders you talk with and work with, what they offer, what they offer to, and what they create for their people to ensure that the businesses are successful and the people are successful. Well, you know, if you look at business as a competitive sport, which I tend to look at it that way, Me as well. think about how you go to market, you, you compete in terms of your product, you can compete in terms of your technology, you compete in terms of your marketing or sales strategies, you compete on your financials, and then finally you compete on the players, the organization. So from a competitive standpoint, in terms of trying to keep competitive advantage, your competitors can buy technology just like you. It's not like your products are great and theirs are not. From a financial, you can keep cutting, but eventually you get to the bone. <clears throat> Marketing and salespeople rotate from company to company. The only thing you cannot buy overnight is upskilling the talent that you have. I mean, you can't sprinkle magic dust over people. So in my mind, all things being equal, the nature of the players and how the players play in the organization, that's the real distinction and decider in a competitive landscape of whether or not you're going to win. And the leaders who get that notion and recognize that and are intentional about attempting to upskill their players are the ones who increase their likelihood of winning in the marketplace. And you see it all the time. You can still win despite yourself. You can still win by being dysfunctional. But eventually, you pay the pipe. That's not a sustainable gain. You know, even if you look at sports teams, you can see sports teams that win because their talent is overwhelming, even though they were dysfunctional. But eventually, they fall apart like a house of cards. It's the same thing in corporations. It's interesting because I do a lot of comparison to sports. Soon, I was talking to a former uh, Vancouver um, Canuck executive, and he talked about how um, you know their for, their aim is to win the championship every year, but they know it's so competitive; it's hard to win the championship every year. But one thing they do mandate is to have the culture of having consistent winning seasons every year. 
Um, right. That applies to the team winning, the, 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 you know, uh, having more wins, but it also applies to their business winning. Right. How would you, you – can you comment on that? No, I, I, I get it. In fact, one of our clients is uh, the Boston Bruins, and that's exactly the culture. And the company that owns them, uh, Delaware North, owns the Bruins, the Boston Gardens. They do a lot of things in sports. And there's no distinction. Uh, I mean, in the end, it's really, again, <laughs> or sports metaphor, but it's about shots on goal. It's about yeah. how do you, it's like that you're constantly on the court. You're always in play. There's always a game. And those individuals that get that are the ones that tend to win. You're, you're, you're creating the, the circumstances that increase the likelihood of a win. That's really what the game's about. No differently than from a business standpoint for myself or many others. I mean, I'm always in play. I'm always entrepreneuring. I'm always creating relationships. I'm always looking for opportunities. I'm always in play. Uh, and even from a career transition, you know this, the people who do the best job from career management are the people who have as simultaneously as many opportunities as possible rather than having like a, a linear uh, career management so I, I concur with what you're saying. Yeah, I thought it, I thought it was pretty brilliant too. And um, you know the the other thing that comes out in sports, and I'm sure you've seen this a million times. The the best legacy of a of a great head coach is how many of their assistant coaches became head coaches, right? Sure, absolutely. That's exactly right. Which we sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm saying that's right. I mean, you know, immediately I thought of like the the great New York Giant football teams in the 80s and Bill Parcells the coach and how many of his people like Belichick and the Red like went on to do other things absolutely yeah and talk to us about how you find um I want to get into employees a little bit but how you find that um one of the key leader one of the key attributes of a, of a true leader in that respect is being able to develop other leaders um, you can't do it all yourself. You never really could, but especially now you can't do it all yourself and you can't know everything. So you got to be, you got to be a true, you have to have true leadership characteristics to be secure enough and able to develop other leaders. Do you not? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's, that's a lot of what we do is in setting up high performance organizations mm -hmm. is uh, as Peter Drucker would call it, it's about distributive decision making. When you talk about global organizations, it's not logical to even think anymore that you have like a little star chamber at the top making all the calls. I mean, it's not, it's not like, you know, chocolates on the assembly line. So from a sophistication, multinational companies have to work more horizontally and the leaders there need to keep creating muscle below so that they have a bench that they can keep, uh, that they can keep growing because in the end, that's what enables them to become more strategic. So, a leader's job of creating teams of leaders around them uh, is exactly what it's going to require from a winning standpoint. Then the only question is, do you have leaders who are conscious enough to get that? And the leaders who are conscious enough produce that. Those that come from a place of scarcity or fear, where they're trying to hold their cards and play a control game, ultimately hit a wall. Very true. You know, not, to, not to get into one of the topics you're not supposed to talk about politics, uh, well, just since we're in the season, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on, on this part. When when you got all these candidates vying to be president, if you will, and people expect and ask them questions about everything, I find it fascinating how they expect whoever it is to know so much about so much. Yeah, I, I, I get it. Uh, that's exactly right. And, you know, frankly, the, the logic would be, the logic would be them them to surround themselves with people who, who get it and their job is to take a look at from a articulating a vision or a picture and having people who are able to fulfill that the idea that you'd have somebody who know is like uh, you know the end all be all from a knowledge standpoint is dysfunctional frankly right it's dysfunctional so when they query the candidates and their expectation is that candidate is going to be buttoned up on diverse matters, whether it be foreign policy, the economy, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not real. But, you know, frankly, not to get into this campaign, <laughs> but the campaign itself feels almost unreal. It's like, I feel like we're watching the, conver the true convergence of politics and entertainment now. I mean, 
it's really a current. It's a current for our eyes. It, it's it's like a show. I was in the UK this past week with a corporation on Monday, and people from various countries are there, and they were just talking about it like they're it's like they're watching a movie. It is it is like a movie, but uh, yeah, you're right not to get too much into it. Although I find it fascinating all the time. Yeah. It's um, media ha- media the internet all of that the same way in some ways that it's impacted business leaders in their businesses has massively impacted and, and almost molded how all these these people who are vying for the position act and for that matter why so many good people won't even bother getting into it because of it right and that's exactly right the, the, the best and the brightest don't want to go through it <laughs> they don't want to go through it uh, and so consequently I think what you get left with is people who have a ego or a sense of narcissism <laughs> that is you know where they where they absolutely are willing to endure running through the gauntlet most people don't want to run through that type of gauntlet yeah no and and for their family too which brings me to another point um when we talk about right fit and it'd be interesting to get from your coaching perspective um when we talk about right fit it's uh, putting people together we talk about the right fit for management that's doing the hiring. We talk about the right fit for the candidate. But so often these days, especially with younger people, we talk about also the right fit for the family of that person as well. How do you see that playing into the world of leadership that you're in with, with companies these days? Uh, elaborate a little more on that uh, so I'm clear what you're asking. Yeah, well, when, when, um, when, when we get clients that are looking for leaders, if you will, in senior level positions... A big part of the discussion comes also to it not only being a right fit for them, but being a right fit for their family, um, which is maybe sound like it sounds like an obvious critical for them to succeed. Their family has to be be there, you know, support them. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's three dimensional. So you'd want to make sure that the family is congruent aspirationally with whatever the individual needs to endure to succeed in that company. And, you know, frankly, if you look at today's world compared to, you know, two, a generation or two ago, people's need to be more three-dimensional from a quality of life standpoint keeps increasing. You see it in data all the time. And, in fact, with the generation coming up, that tends to be a huge factor in whether or not they're going to go into a particular role. Whereas when I was coming up, when I got into the corporate world, I felt like I climbed over the Berlin Wall. I felt like now I really made it. And it was something that I really aspired to. The challenge today is that, you know, people's belief that the corporate world is now some type of, you know, mecca and that you're over there, you're, you're okay, and that eventually you'll get the gold watch at the end. People know now it's just a pipe dream, but that wasn't the case when I was coming up, you know, 40 years ago. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. You know, got my, my, my first major job at Deloitte and Touche and kind of made it, even though I kind of knew I didn't want to be a partner anyway, right at the beginning. But you, it is different now. And it's a, it's a great point you raised, and it'll lead me to another point here about, you know, I talk a lot about the younger people these days, which can be annoying sometimes, but I talk a lot about it. And um, I really admire that they come into play for not trying to, you know, they know their why. It's not just about getting money. It's not about the bigger house. It's not about the car. They're looking for experiences, basically, I find. And I'm sure that comes up in your coaching of leaders, too. Yes, yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, the, the thing that uh, when you look at um, leaders today and going back to the point around like a, a quality of life and you look at what are the factors that determine someone's perception of their job having a a high quality work life. The factors really around people having a belief that they are able to influence their environment, that they can impact their goals, that they're valued and recognized by the organization, and that the job is first and foremost congruent with their values and beliefs. Right. So to me, that type of congruence uh, between people's perception of quality of life and the job and so that you're, it, so it feels fairly seamless is what ultimately is going to determine whether or not you've got a happy worker. Yeah, and it's, and and it so, goes. It, yeah, you're right. It goes to this other point I have about um, 
how important um, how important it has been for leaders to understand that their their employees are now, if you like it or not, true ambassadors of their company, especially with social media. And you talk about employee engagement, which is lots of different kinds. There's engagement internally, whether it's from wellness or, or other other factors. But employees are engaging externally. And I remember the days when you know uh, leaders were worried about them getting on the internet. And you can't just tell them not to get on the internet. But talk a little bit about how executives you find um, do their best to engage employees to be part of their branding and part of that winning culture that we were talking about before. Well, in the work that we do, when we align teams mm -hmm. um, so that it works as a horizontal or high performing team, what I said earlier about enrollment, um, you want people, ultimately from an accountability uh, and the first level of accountability is when an individual is accountable for themselves, which is good. Mm -hmm. The second level is they take accountability for their people. In most companies, that's as good as it gets. The third level is they take accountability for their peers. That's the beginning of a high-performance team. The fourth level is take accountability for the leader's success. And the fifth level is you take accountability for the enterprise. For the enterprise. So, basically, leaders willingness to incent people to take accountability for the enterprise beyond their own functional silo is what, is what ultimately is going to enable individuals to feel that sense of ownership in the organization. Without that, they're not going to be a representative of the brand. They've got to really own the brand. They've got to think of it almost like it's like their family business. That's the level psychologically that you'd like to get people to. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's brilliant. And, uh, and um you know, it's not that easy to do, but if you do it, you win. No, exactly. That's exactly right. So a few personal questions. Not that personal. So don't get, don't get nervous. But a few personal questions, short answers. Do you have a pet? No. We did a, a Shetland sheepdog, but she passed away. No. So right now we are petless. Yeah, I've got an almost 15-year-old Doberman, so I, I know. Um, do you have a favorite activity or sport? Yeah, well, I, uh, I work out obsessively. And um, I'm an avid bike rider, kayaker, wow. and boater. I love boating. I just absolutely love boating. So I, water sports are really what I enjoy the most. Cool. I'm into the water sports too, but it's usually the frozen one on the ice for hockey. Um, okay. <laughs> by the way, I'm a Canadians fan. Sorry. Um, um, do you have a favorite movie or TV show? I'd say my favorite all-time TV show probably would be uh, The Twilight Zone. <laughs> I'm an avid fan of sci-fi and horror. Very and cool. Fun. And movies, I'd probably say Casablanca. I'm a very big fan of classic movies. Every year I make the pilgrimage to Hollywood to go to the Turner Classic Film Festival. So black and white movies from the 30s, 40s. If I wasn't doing this, and if I had to do it over, I'd be a professor of film history, focusing on the 30s, 40s. So, yeah, that's that's a real passion of mine. Come well, on, know some people at USC. I can see if I can get you in there. Um, <laughs> how about uh, favorite book? Favorite book? That's an interesting one. Yeah, it is. Well, if I was going to be politically correct, I'd say the Bible. That's not really the truth. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd say um, hmm, favorite book. Actually, you know, when I think about it, there, there's a there's a great sci-fi book. Um, by Robert McKinnon, and I'm, and my mind is going on me, and I can't remember the title of it. But I would say large books like like It by Stephen King, I really love. Sure. So to me, it's again, it's in the realm of the, you know, the supernatural. It's, uh, it's very escapist for me. Well, we'll put it out there for the audience to Google it, and they'll send it back, which with the name now of that one. It's going to be troubling to me not to remember that title. Swan Song is called Swan Song. Oh, by great. Robert McKinnon. It's an epic sci-fi apocalyptic story, and I find that really, that, that book stays with me. Yeah, that was good. That was one of the more unique answers. How about music and food? Music, I'm, uh, you know, it's like classic rock, mm -hmm. R&B, blues, and jazz. Um, and as for food, I would say uh, seafood. Oh, seafood. Very cool. I mean, when voting the keys last week, every day, eventually it was stone crab, lobster, it worked for me. 
I'm with you. <laughs> Great choices. Thanks so much. Sure.